Somebody be glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. You got to stand for the reading of God's word today. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad I'm sitting next to you this morning. Amen. Bless God. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to ask if you would turn them with me to the book of Ephesians. We're going to Ephesians chapter number 1, Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to begin at verse number 15. Trust that you had a great Thanksgiving, that you were with family, that you were with friends, and that uh, you just had a great time together. I know that, boy, this holiday season is going to be rough with everything going on, but our God is greater. Can you say amen to that? And I just believe we need to be encouraged with that. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to begin at verse number 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Which means that as we grow in the knowledge of the Lord, we gain a spirit or a mind of wisdom and revelation. Then he goes on and says, the eyes of your understanding. Understanding there is talking about your heart or your will. He says that the eyes of your heart, your will, would be enlightened or illuminated by the Holy Spirit so that you may know what is the hope of His calling. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. I want to share with you for just a few moments a very simple message that I've entitled that you may know, specifically leaning into what we must carry into the days ahead. Listen, I believe if there was ever a time when we needed to be hiding the Word of God in our hearts that we would not sin against God, it is a day that we are living in. And certainly we need to know all truth that would set us free. But I believe that there are some things that we specifically need to know in this hour if we are going to make it in the days that lie ahead. And Father, we bow in your presence and we ask that you would meet every hungry heart here this morning and that you would flood their hearts and their wills with the light of the Holy Spirit. That we may know these things as we move into the days ahead. We don't know what the days ahead will hold. But we do know that you have given us truth that will set us free from fear, from anxiety, from panic. Lord, no matter what those days bring. And I pray that today our hearts would be comforted in these things. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said amen and amen. Would you give the Lord praise in this house one more time before you're seated? Amen. And before you're seated, turn to your neighbor and tell him you love him in Jesus' name. Bless the Lord. You know, none of us could have ever seen the events of 2020 coming. Even when you look back at those very first few weeks of reporting coming out of China concerning the coronavirus, none of us could have ever imagined where we would be just one year later. And the truth is that we have no idea what 21 is going to look like either. I, I, I hope that it's going to be better, and certainly my prayer is that 21 is going to be much better, but Let's be honest, it could get a lot messier. When we hear some of the things that we're hearing today, when we consider some of the decisions that have been made in this country and the direction that it currently looks like we're heading in, things could get a lot more messy. And the virus is only one part of that equation too. I would encourage you maybe today to just find a timeline for 2020 and consider all that we have been through this year. It is hard to imagine because it happened a year ago, but we started this year with an impeachment trial. We've almost forgotten about that, but that's where we started, and it really has snowballed after that. 
Look at how much we've been through this past year. Look at all that we've been through in just the last four months in the United States of America. And as depressing as that might be, listen, at some point, I am convinced that we're going to come out of this. Turn to your neighbor and say, I hope, I hope we come out of this. I mean, we, you, you know, you've got to think that at some point, we're going to come out of this. But the question that's really been in my heart throughout this week is, what are we going to come out of this to? What are we going to look like as a country when this is over? When the dust settles, what will change in the United States of America and even around the world? What are we going to lose? What are we going to face? What will the church look like in the near future and should the Lord tarry in the distant future? What will religious freedom look like in the United States of America if it even exists at all in the future? What will it cost us if we remain steadfast and on compromise in our commitment to the Lord and we are willing to lay down our lives for the truth of God's word? Folks, I just really want us to consider that today. You know, many pastors in this critical hour are trying so hard to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and discern the voice of the Lord so as to prepare the people that have been entrusted to them for the days that lie ahead, while at the same time trying to discern ministering words of healing and comfort for men and women who have absolutely been ravaged by the events of this past year. I mean, let's be honest, marriages have been viciously assaulted during this time. Families have come under great attack. People are beyond afraid. They're terrified in all that we are going through in this hour. The election has devastated families and friends and even fellow believers. Churches have divided and have split over all that has happened with the election Let's be honest, there is just a real sense of heaviness that weighs upon the hearts and minds of men and women, even in the body of Christ. When I talk to many Christians today, I don't sense joy. I don't sense any um, peace within them. There's just this great cloud of heaviness and this uncertainty that we are living with today. I don't know how many of you saw it, but last night, right before I went to bed, I read an article about how in Japan, they have had more suicides than they have deaths from coronavirus this year. More men and women have committed suicide in Japan than have died of the coronavirus or even something related to the coronavirus. And that is just a telling sign when you consider what the fallout of this hour has been. And I've said it for a long time. I don't know that we'll ever be able to quantify all of the hurt and the pain that has come from this lockdown that the world has experienced. And it just seems like we're oblivious to it. I was listening to an interview with a pastor the other day who was just bringing back to my remembrance things that we know, but we just kind of forget. I mean, think of all the men and women who lost loved ones in this last year, but there's never been any closure because they couldn't have a funeral. They couldn't have any memorial service. They couldn't gather together with their families and grieve together as they were supposed to. Think of all the celebrations of milestones that we enjoy celebrating because they bring us together that were missed, birthdays and anniversaries and graduations. We've missed out on those things, and only God... God knows how that has affected the hearts and the minds of men and women in this hour. And that's so sad because it's usually around this time of the year that our spirits tend to be lifted up again as we go through Christmas and we go through Christmas Eve and Thanksgiving and even into New Year's Eve and New Year's Day where we gather together with family and with friends and we just think about the goodness of God and we think of his faithfulness in our lives. But even That has been stripped from us this year as men and women continue to just belabor this point of isolation and stay separated. And I I understand that for men who are without Christ, that seems like the best thing to do. But as believers, we know that we were created to fellowship, that we were created to be with one another. And even that is being attacked 
And as I waited on the Lord this week, I just felt that the Lord was leading me to encourage hearts of the faithful this morning. And I want to tell you folks, I know that it sounds old-fashioned and it's often repeated, but I want you to know that you need to be encouraged because God is still on the throne. Amen. He has still got everything in his mighty hands. He still loves you. He is not going to leave us. He is not going to forsake us no matter how difficult this hour may be. We need to lift up our voices and we need to lift up our hands and fight through all of the temptation to not give him glory and to praise him because he still is God Almighty and he's going to see us through this in Jesus' name. We need to go into this new year with confidence, not self-confidence, not confidence in ourselves, but confident in the Lord. We need to finish this year strong so that we can enter into the new year with even greater strength. We need a fresh revelation of who he is, and we need a fresh revelation of who we are in Christ, and a fresh revelation of what we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and we need a revelation of all that we can do through the power of the Holy Spirit that abides in us so that we do not just go into 21 barely hanging on, but we go into this new year knowing that no matter what we face, our God is greater than it all in Jesus' mighty name. And these can no longer be just cute, sweet, pithy cliches and sentiments that we repeat in times of difficulty. They have to become the convictions of our heart that we hold fast to so that we can weather the storms that are ahead in Jesus' name. And so as I was just waiting on the Lord and meditating on that thought this week, I was reminded of this text that we have before us here in Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to tell you, this is a portion of scripture that has been near and dear to my heart for many years. Probably 28 years ago, when I was just starting out in the ministry, the Lord laid a message on my heart from this particular text, and it just became a staple in my life for the next few years. Whenever I was invited to minister the word of the Lord somewhere for an extended period of time, I would always minister this word. It just encouraged my heart. In fact, I preached it the Sunday night that I came here to candidate nearly 25 years ago now. And I I just have always been drawn to this text because of the hope that is within it in Jesus' name. Now, we know this letter as the book of Ephesians. But understand that it wasn't necessarily directed exclusively to the Ephesian Christians or the Ephesian church. It's probably better understood as a circular letter. It may have been addressed to the church at Ephesus, but that was because they were the first city on a mail route in that particular region. And it would have circulated through all of the churches in that region, which would have been ancient Asia Minor and modern-day Western Turkey. And so they may have received it first, but then they circulated it to the other churches. But it was addressed specifically, we would think, to Ephesus because Paul had a great um, connection with that church. Many of you know, and you can read about it in Acts chapter 19, that Paul experienced a powerful move of God in the city of Ephesus. Probably one of the greatest moves of God in the book of Acts, and maybe within the entire word of God. Within the span of two years, Paul literally had changed the city through the power of the Holy Spirit, and had actually impacted that entire region within those two years. Now, eventually he left, but even after he left, that church continued to grow and develop for the glory of God. And so many years later, while Paul is in prison in Rome, he writes this letter addressing it to the Ephesians, but to go out to all of the churches and listen to what he says again in verse 16. I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. I do not cease to give thanks for you and pray for you. Now that really hit me. 
in spite of the obvious growth that this church had experienced and was still experiencing at that point, Paul prayed for them without ceasing. Boy, that is a reminder to every one of us that there will never be a time when we have arrived in our faith and no longer have to depend upon the Lord. And that dependence upon the Lord is reflected in prayer. Listen, every man and every woman that is dependent upon the Lord will pray every day and seek the face of God. If you do not pray every day, and I'm not talking religiously, but if you are not waiting upon God and seeking his face, the Bible calls you a self-confident, self-reliant fool. And that is just the long and the short of it. If you are dependent upon God, it is not going to be by the confession of your mouth. It is going to be fleshed out on your knees. How many of you know if there was ever a time when we needed to be on our knees, it is the day that we are living in right now. We need to be praying like we have never prayed. And that's why Paul said, I do not cease to pray for you. And it's that word cease that I kind of want to lean into here this morning for a moment. Prayer is to be ceaseless. It was the Apostle Paul who told us in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17, pray without ceasing. We are to pray without ceasing. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that we're to hide ourselves in our bedroom and lock ourselves in our homes and we're not to do anything but pray all the time? No, of course, we have jobs and we have other responsibilities. We have parental responsibilities. We have, you know, vocational responsibilities. I mean, certainly, we have to do more than that. The idea is that we're always walking in an attitude of prayer. That we are walking out our lives constantly aware of our dependence upon the Holy Spirit. That while we're raising our children, that while we're paying our taxes, that while we're paying our bills, that while we are functioning as husbands and wives and sons and daughters, that we are constantly aware of our need for the Lord and not leaning upon our own understanding, but letting him direct us in all of our ways. That's what he means with in praying without ceasing. Lord, I need you today. Lord, without you, I'm going to fail. Lord, there are pitfalls here that I cannot see, but you see all things. That's what praying without ceasing means. And why are we to pray without ceasing? Because folks, I don't need to tell you, we're in a battle and we are wrestling against an enemy that will not relent, that will not give up, that will not grow weary, that does not become discouraged, and he only withdraws momentarily in order to look for a more opportune time to attack. And it's for that reason that we cannot stop praying and seeking the face of the living God, recognizing that only he can prepare us for what is ahead in Jesus' name. So we need to pray without ceasing, not only for ourselves, but for one another. We need to be praying for the body of Christ in this hour. How many of you, and I'm not asking for a show of hands, but how many of you regularly pray for the body of Christ? Seeking the Lord for your brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. You know, this past week I found myself considering the, the, uh, the, the moment that Jesus went with the disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he was betrayed. Do you remember what he said to them on the way in? He said, pray that you enter not into temptation. And then he said these critical words. He said, because your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. What he was saying to them is, listen, you need to pray that you would enter not into temptation, that you would not fall in this test. Because even though your spirit is indeed willing, he said, that's not the issue, guys. You just told me in the upper room that you're not going to forsake me. And so I know that you're willing to overcome, 
But he says, what you don't realize is that your flesh is weaker than you could imagine, and it has a greater influence on you than you ever recognize. And the only way that you can make up that deficiency is on your knees in prayer. You cannot do this in your own strength. So pray that you enter not into temptation. And I'm going to tell you today, folks, no sincere believer wants to succumb to temptation, but desires to overcome the test. But our flesh is weaker than we could ever imagine, and it has a greater influence upon our decisions than we could ever recognize. And folks, the X factor, the game changer in our lives is prayer. Without prayer, you and I are going to stumble and fall throughout our days. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And that comes to pass in prayer in Jesus' name. Listen to what the uh, listen to what Jesus said, excuse me, in Luke 21 in verse 34. Now this is in the amplified version. He says, "But take heed to yourselves and be on your guard lest your hearts be overburdened and depressed." weighed down and the, with giddiness and headache and nausea of self-indulgence, drunkenness, and worldly worries and cares perter- pertaining to the business of this life and lest that day come upon you suddenly like a trap or a noose. For it will come upon all who live upon the face of the entire earth. Keep awake then and watch at all times. Be discreet, attentive, and ready, praying that you may have the full strength and ability and be counted worthy to escape all these things taken together that will take place and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. Folks, I know that this is directed primarily to those who are going to be alive on the earth at the time of the great tribulation. But I want you to know that it also speaks to you and I today. We need to be on guard every moment of our lives, lest our hearts become overburdened and depressed with self-indulgence, with worldly worries and cares pertaining to the business of this civilian life, and that the day of the Lord come upon us suddenly like a trap or a noose. Folks, we need to be awake. We need to pray that we would have the full strength and ability and be accounted worthy to escape all of these things. Can I tell you, folks, it is time to pray. It is time to force yourself down on those knees every day and say, Lord, I dare not engage this life without the power of the Spirit of God in my life. In Jesus' name. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but right after the Apostle Paul wrote about our spiritual warfare and the necessity of the full armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, listen to what he says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication, say this with me, for all the saints. You know, for many of us, we only pray for ourselves, or we only pray for our immediate family. But Paul said, no, one of the greatest things that we can do in warfare is to pray with all prayers and supplication and the perseverance and supplication for all of the saints. We need to pray for one another. Folks, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I'm going to pray for you. Will you pray for me? We need to seek the face of God in this hour in Jesus' name. Now, What did Paul pray for specifically? Well, he tells us right there in verse 17, he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Paul prayed that God, the Father of Jesus Christ and of all glory, would give to the believers in that region a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And that the eyes of their understanding or that the eyes of their heart would be filled with light or would be illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Now, I could say a lot there. I'm going to resist the temptation so that we can keep on track here today. But again, I would just say the idea 
is that as they grow in their knowledge of Almighty God, that the Holy Spirit would illuminate their will and that they would have a spirit of wisdom and of revelation concerning these things that he is going to lay out for us here in a moment. Now, what is interesting to me is that Paul understood that the only way that these believers and even believers today would ever grasp the things that he was going to pray for them to receive would be if the God Almighty would reveal them to them. That is important to understand. And what is intriguing to me is that the Apostle Paul arguably was the greatest preacher, was the greatest teacher that ever walked on the face of the earth outside of Jesus Christ. Obviously, Jesus was the greatest teacher, but outside of him, Paul was certainly the greatest because of all of the revelation knowledge that he had received from Almighty God. And yet Paul said, I'm praying that God would illuminate your heart to know these things. Paul recognized that there were some things that could never be taught. They had to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. He said, I can stand here and teach them to you every time we gather together, but unless the Holy Spirit illuminates your heart and your mind, you're never going to grasp these things. And I haven't always recognized this as a pastor But through the years, I've come to recognize that my responsibility, though I am a teacher, is really to introduce you to the Word of God, to open up the Word and to show you what God has said, but only the Holy Spirit can teach them to you. And that is why there are some people that can sit under the Word of God for years, and it never does anything in them. But then there are some that hear it for the first time, and immediately they run with it because there are some people that are still trying to figure it out in their natural mind but there's others that are relying upon the spirit of God and it comes alive in them and they live by it in Jesus mighty name you know I, I want to preface what I'm about to say with this I am certainly not against higher education um, I, I have no problem with pastors getting their master's degrees and their doctorates. You know, sometimes I wish that I had done that when I was a younger man, and who knows, maybe I'll do that at some point in the future myself. So I don't want anyone to think that I am knocking higher education. I believe that we need to have a greater understanding of the Word of God. So again, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The problem is, is that many times we as pastors, we gather our master's degrees and our doctorates and we even go after double doctorates and more master's degree because in the back of our mind we think that if we can get enough education that maybe I'll be able to formulate a better argument where I can convince men and women of these truths. But folks, I've learned through the years that it doesn't matter how much time I take studying the Word of God. If you do not have the Holy Spirit revealing these things to you, I'm never going to convince you with my words and my understanding. Paul was the most educated of all of the apostles. He said, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, which I don't have time to talk to you about the years of intensive study it took to get to that level. But many years later, he said to the Philippian church, the things I once thought were gain, I now count as loss, that I may know the Lord, not just in the fellowship of his sufferings, but also in the power of his resurrection. He's saying it's not in my strength. It's in the power of the spirit of the living God that these things come alive and you live in them in Jesus' mighty name. And this is why Paul said to the, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 in verse 13 he says, these things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. 
If you were to go over to chapter 1 in 1 Corinthians, you would hear him say, we preach Christ and him crucified. And he said, understanding that there are some that when they hear the message of the cross, they consider it foolishness. And there are others that consider it scandalous. But to those who believe it is the power of God unto salvation. He said, listen, I realized a long time ago that unless a man has opened up himself to the Spirit of God, he will never discern it. And that's why some of you leave this Sunday morning services and you just think, well, I don't know what he was talking about and that's not what I needed to hear. You're trying to figure it out in your natural mind and it will always be foolishness to you. But to those who humble themselves and say, God, your ways are higher than my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts, then you will leave with a greater understanding of what God has provided for you and equipped you for in this hour in Jesus' mighty name. And I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 3. He says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And you say, well, why was he so fearful? It wasn't a fear that was of man. It was a fear of God. Again, earlier in chapter 1, he had said that he was concerned that somehow his preaching would actually distract men and women from the message of the cross and nullify what Jesus had done. And he was so afraid that his message would do that, that he said, I came among you with weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of of Almighty God. He said, I was determined when I came among you that I was not going to worry about how I spoke and my rhetoric and my preaching and my persuasive words because I don't want you to leave a sermon with your faith in the message. I want your faith to be in the power of an Almighty God. And the older that I get, the more that I realize God didn't call me to be a great preacher. He just called me to give you the word of the Lord so that your your faith and confidence would not be in this message because I guarantee you, you'll forget it by tomorrow morning, but you'll never forget when the power of God came upon you and strengthened you to do what God has called you to do in Jesus' mighty name. Folks, I want your faith to be in the power of the Holy Spirit because we are moving into a day and an age where you're going to need the Holy Spirit if you're going to make it because I believe we're living in an hour when you're going to need to know the voice of the Holy Spirit at the midnight hour. And he says, get up and run now. Don't go there. Don't move there. Don't say this. Say that because we are living in an hour that is against Christ, but our God has equipped us with everything we need so that we will overcome come in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, somebody. Give God the praise for that if you believe it. So, what specifically did Paul pray that the Spirit would reveal to them? That's an introduction. But we're not going to be that long on these, trust me, okay? What did he specifically say you and I needed to know as we move into the days ahead? Number one, he wants us to know the hope of his calling. He wants us to know the hope of his calling. Boy, if there was ever a time when we needed a message of hope, it is the day that we are living in. Can you say amen? I mean, men and women are looking for a message of hope. And we have got to go into this New Year's believers with hope. And the only hope that will carry us is the hope of his calling. Folks, listen to me right now. If your hopes are resting upon a vaccine, if your hope is fixed upon a new president and a new administration that will be able to fix the ills of this country, restore peace and unity in our streets, that your retirement portfolio is going to rebound and is going to get great gains and that we are going to be all well and good by the end of next year, I will tell you right now, you're going to be an emotional wreck by the end of 21. And that's because you have fixed all of your hopes in uncertainty. Because I'm going to tell you, there is not one 
one man on this planet that can make it all go away in 12 months. I'm going to tell you, folks, if your hope is fixed in anything but Almighty God, you are going to be all over the place. And that is why so many people are panicking right now because they are fixed in uncertainty. But for a child of God, our hope is fixed on what is certain, that our God is faithful, that he is unchangeable, that as he is, he will always and forever be. He is an unchangeable God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I am thankful for my hope in his calling that no matter what this world goes through, my God is going to carry me through it all in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody, give God the praise for that. Listen to this powerful word. In John 15 and verse 16, Jesus says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Hallelujah. You know, for many years, people have debated, did God choose us or did we choose the Lord? Well, Jesus made it very clear. You did not choose me. I chose you. Yes, you responded to God by faith. But that faith was given to you by Almighty God. He gives to every man a measure of faith. He initiated the plan. The Bible makes it clear that no one goes after God. No one seeks for him. If God had not started it, then you would have never gone after him. But by the grace of God, one day he called your name out. And by grace, you responded to it. You are the called. You are the chosen of Almighty God. In Jesus' name, give him praise if you believe it. But he goes beyond that. He says, he chose you and he appointed you. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you're appointed. You are appointed to live in this earth at this time. Of all the other ages that you could have been born in, God specifically appointed you for this day. And with all the challenges that are going on, it's important for us to realize, wait a minute, God chose me for this hour. God chose me to live in this critical moment in Jesus' name. For what purpose? That we should go and bear fruit. I don't care how difficult it is. We can still bear fruit for the glory and the honor of God. Can I hear a better amen than that? I'm going to tell you, some of us are looking at how bad things are getting right now, and we're thinking, Jesus, get us out of here. And Jesus is saying, no, wait a minute. I appointed you for this hour to bear fruit for me and that your fruit would remain. What does that mean? It means that we store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt and thieves do not break in and steal. Some of you are sweating your retirement because you're seeing it all over the place. I'm going to tell you there's a greater investment and that is in the kingdom of Almighty God. What are you sowing into his kingdom today? Your fruit will remain and that whatever you ask of the Father in the name of Jesus, it will be given to you. My heart would crush today day if I didn't have this hope that if my heart is sincere before God when I ask my father for anything in the name of his son it is given to me in Jesus mighty name that is the hope of his calling would somebody give God the praise for that today in Jesus name but then listen he says this in first Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 but you are a chosen generation You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He called you out of darkness. How many of you are glad that he called you out of darkness today in Jesus' name? Of three of you, how many of you are glad that he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light? But what did he call you to? He says it right there, to show forth the praises of the one who called you out of darkness. And that's why Jesus, and I say this all the time, but this is why Jesus said to us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father that is in heaven. You and I were called out of darkness to live a life of light in darkness and show forth the praises of the one that called us because he's calling them as well in Jesus' name. That is the hope of his calling. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' 
name, on Christ the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Give him all the praise. If you have hope today in his call, bless the Lord. But you know, he also wants us to know today the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I love this. He wants us to know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, listen, contrary to popular belief, this is not talking about the inheritance that we will receive when we go to be with the Lord, though we certainly do have an inheritance in Christ. We know that. We already mentioned it. You know, that we store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and thieves do not break in and steal. Thank God for that. But I look over at Romans chapter 8 and we are told that we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba, Father, the spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children of God, then heirs of the Father. And if heirs of the Father, then heirs with the Son, Jesus Christ. So we stand to inherit everything that that Christ has received for us for all of eternity. How many of you are thankful for that great inheritance that we have in heaven waiting for us? But that's not what he's talking about here. He specifically says the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Paul is speaking here of the Father's inheritance one day in the saints. Do you remember the story of the talents that Jesus taught us? And how the Father bestows upon all of us talents and that he expects us to multiply those talents so that when he comes again, he would have a return on his investment. That's what's being discussed here. God has invested in every true believer his glory and we are to go forth and glorify the Lord as we talked about a moment ago, bearing fruit so that one day when we stand in the presence of God, we will have all of the gains that we did here on this earth that will glorify the Father and his grace for all of eternity. You are the inheritance of God. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you are the inheritance of God. That's an important thing to know. Listen to what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 5 and 7. Even when we were dead in trespasses, listen, you weren't squirming, you were dead. And a dead man cannot bring himself back to life. How many of you know it is by grace that you have been saved? We were dead in our trespasses. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together. Listen, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So understand what he's saying here. He's saying you were dead and there is no one that would have even given you a moment of their time. You were absolutely dead in your sin, in your transgression. You were cut off from the grace of Almighty God. And I could have left you there in that dead state, but I wanted to show my loving kindness throughout the ages. And so I came, and by grace, I saved you and made you my sons and my daughters so that one day when you're standing in heaven with me, your life would stand as a testimony, not of your intestinal fortitude or your willpower but of my grace so that all throughout the ages men and women may know that I am the great and the almighty God in Jesus mighty name. You see this is where value and worth in our lives comes from. We have no value. We have no worth and for, se for some reason some of us think that we're all of that and a bag of chips and we think that we did a God a favor when we got saved. I'm going to tell you we have no worth. We have no value. We were sinners against God, dead in our sin and lost for eternity. But one day God called us out of darkness. He saved us. He healed us. He delivered us. He has made me glad today. He gave me value by his grace. And now I want to make sure that I use that grace to glorify him so that as I stand before him one day, my life would radiate throughout the ages. The power of Almighty God and what He has done. Come on, somebody, give God the praise for that if you believe it. 
We just don't think about it. God invested his son, the blood of his son, the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit, and all the spiritual gifts that go with them, not to bury those gifts, but to use them to make gains for the kingdom of Almighty God so that throughout the ages, God would receive the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. One more time, give him all the praise if you believe that. Amen and amen. And then... Finally, the third thing that he wants us to know is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. The exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. We must go into this new year, can I tell you, with a deep, life-altering knowledge of the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Folks, if you do not know how to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, I just don't know how you're going to make it. I'm just being honest. We need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. If your power is being derived from marriage, from friendships, from relationships, from money, from a career, from government, and that's where your hope lies, then you will certainly fail. It must come from the Holy Spirit. He says the exceeding greatness of his power And that means the incomparable, the immeasurable power of God that is toward those who believe. And as we enter into an age of uncertainty, we need to know the incomparable, immeasurable power of God that is available to us who believe. And how powerful is that power? He answers that question. Right there in verse 19, he says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? Listen, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and he gave him to be head over all things to the church of Jesus Christ. Listen, his power raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places, above all principalities and powers, might and dominion, above every name that could be named, not only in this present age, but in the ages to come, and he has placed everything under his feet. And that is the power that is available to everyone that believes right now. Isn't there anybody excited about that? God says, I'm going to share this power with my saints. Think about it. The same power that invaded the tomb of Jesus Christ that first evening. Easter Sunday morning is the same power that can invade our lives in times of crisis, in times of testing, in times of weakness to quicken us so that we will overcome. I wish that somebody would shout unto God with a voice of triumph. That power is available to us today in Jesus' name. Folks, Paul tells us that that power saved us. Romans 1 and verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. It's this power that empowers us to endure trials. In Colossians 1 and verse 11, we're strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. And then in Jude, we're told that this power will keep us to the very end. Now under him who is able. Come on, say it. Who is able. Say it. Who is able. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I serve a God who is able to keep me from stumbling in this hour and to present me faultless, not in my own works, but in the works of Jesus Christ. All I can tell you is everything that we face in this hour, God has the power to bring us through it in Jesus mighty name if God can raise his son from the dead by this power he can resurrect a marriage he can restore your family he can heal your body he can give you joy in the storm he can strengthen your mind your emotions and your will he has put every enemy under his feet and that means that if I abide in Christ then all of my enemies are under his feet as well in Jesus name come on somebody shout unto God with a voice of triumph in Jesus mighty name hallelujah you know I remember the the first time I got 
a turbocharged car. I don't know how many of you have ever had a turbo uh, engine before, but the first time I, I got one, I didn't know what that technology was. You know, I thought that turbo, in my mind, I just thought that I would get 88 miles an hour and be kicked into the future or, or in the past or whatever. I, I thought that maybe it would be like hitting the, the light speed, you know, and all of a sudden I would go into hyperspace or whatever the case may be. But they sat down and they said, listen, it's not like that. It's not like you're going to just be driving and all of a sudden you hit a button or hit this moment. So it's not what turbo means. Turbo just means that you're going to have power available when you need it. He says, it just, it's always there with you. You just don't always need it. But in the moment you need it, when you hit that accelerator, it will kick in. If you need to pass someone quickly, if you need to accelerate quickly, the turbo is going to provide the power that you need. Let me tell you something, folks. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force or power. He is a presence that abides within us. And he walks with us. He talks with us. He tells us we are his own. And I will tell you that in various times in your life when you need the power, it will be available to you to bring you through in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. But it's in a relationship. It's, it's living your life with the Holy Spirit. It's not just ignoring Him and then when you need Him, you got to hit some button or quote the right scripture. It's abiding in the vine in Jesus' mighty name. Listen, folks, I don't know what's coming, but I know this. We have unshakable hope in His call. We are the inheritance of God and we need to act like that inheritance. And we know that the power of God is working in us mightily. And he has equipped us for this hour. Do not be afraid. In Jesus' mighty name. Yeah, go ahead and give God the praise in Jesus' name. Bless the Lord. And I, this I'm going to close. And you've got to watch this. Verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. The next verse is where he says, do not cease to give uh, thanks for you and pray for you. Okay. Notice that he didn't feel a release to pray for them until he would con was first convinced of their faith in Jesus Christ as evidenced in their love for all the saints. And so the reality is this all begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. And I'll tell you, I have made a determination that in this coming year, we are going to start emphasizing the necessity of salvation. And we, we do anyway, but we're going to make sure that almost every Sunday, and I wouldn't say every Sunday because, you know, the Lord can direct us, but we are going to be giving more of an opportunity for men and women to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because folks... The only thing that matters in this hour is whether you know Christ as Savior. Paul said, I, 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 I can't pray these things for you until you start there. And that it's not just faith in Jesus Christ, but it's evidenced in your love for all of the saints. And so folks, listen, I look around and I, I, I know most of you, and so I could just assume that most of you have received Christ as Lord and Savior. I would assume that probably the majority of those that are watching us online today, you know the Lord, but there could be those among us that do not know the Lord. Those who are watching, you do not know the Lord. Even if you're not watching today, maybe in the future you'll be watching this. But listen, I'm going to tell you flat out, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you have no hope. You have none. And that's why you stress out over elections and over political parties because that's all you've got to hang on to. You have no inheritance, and you are no inheritance, and you have no power at all. It has to begin with accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, with a recognition that we have all sinned against God and fallen short of living out the purpose for which we were created, and that is to give glory to the Lord. 
And as sinners, there is nothing we can do to make ourselves right with God. But the goodness of God is revealed in the cross of Jesus Christ who died as a sinner, though he knew no sin, to be a substitute for our penalty. So that if we would confess our sins, he would be faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then he rose again on the third day. And how many of you are glad he rose again on the third day to give us the hope of everlasting life and also the hope of being indwelt with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead to live this life that God has called us to live. That's where it must begin. And so I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed all across this auditorium. Father, you know these things are near and dear to my heart, and I pray that every man and every woman that is here today, that is watching online, would just simply look into the scriptures and they would begin to wait upon you because, again, I can introduce these thoughts to you to them, but it's you that must teach them. It's you that must reveal the hope of the calling that they are the inheritance of the Father and that you have all the power that they need. But Father, for that one that is here today that does not know Christ as their Lord and Savior, even if they have professed, but in their heart they know that they do not know you, I pray that today you would stir their heart. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. There's no one looking around. Is there anyone here today that would just raise their hand? Say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Is there anyone here with us today? Bless the Lord. I see that hand. Is there anyone else? Many of you know that I, I've had that love-hate relationship with the sinner's prayer because I just think that we put too much emphasis on, on a man-made prayer and when I look at scripture, I don't see that. The Bible just says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. The Bible says if we confess our sin and forsake our sin, he'll be faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so even there as you sit, you can open up your heart and cry out to God for mercy. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you're watching online, you can do the same. Call upon the name of the Lord. And if you've done that today, then do not keep that to yourself. You need to come to me. You need to come to one of the other pastors or a deacon or an elder. You need to go to someone and you need to share that with them because this is just the beginning. We now grow in our faith, and we want to be here to help you in any way we possibly can. In Jesus.